this. We love Jesus a little bit here. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It, it makes a, it is one of my favorite things to watch as the body ministers one to another. And I'm going to preach about that now here in, in the name of Jesus. But if you receive prayer today and when you get, when you, when your answer comes, you come and tell us so that we can rejoice with you and celebrate with you. God is good. He is at work. Amen. Kids, you may be dismissed for, to Kids Church this morning. Have an awesome time together. Thank you, Ed. What a wonderful job leading us in the presence of the Lord this morning. It was good to dance a little bit in the house of God today. Amen. Awesome. So for the rest of us, if you've got your Bibles, let's turn to Revelation chapter 2 this morning. Revelation chapter 2. We'll get there in a moment, but you'll be ready to go. We are so glad that you're here. Awesome. They're going to go have a good time. There's a pinball machine in Sunday school today, which I realized that there might be some, like, my, like, granny is probably rolling over somewhere. But anyways, uh, they're going to have an awesome time uh, in our kids. I'm thankful for Anna, Sally, the team that serves so faithfully, our children. Amen. Awesome. Well, let's dig right in. We're continuing on a sermon series called Battle Ready. And just to put it in context, if you haven't been here the last number of weeks, uh, the Bible talks a lot about the dynamics of spiritual forces in the world and the need for battling against the forces of evil, forces of darkness. And I won't unpack all of that today. We preached on that the last number of weeks. And you can follow us on YouTube, uh, gatewayfoursquare.ca, or on our website to get caught up on some of our previous sermons. So I won't rehash all of them, but I want to I just bring us another aspect to, to spiritual warfare today. And over the last few weeks, we've been talking about particularly uh, the personal application of that. The, uh, there is an enemy of your soul called the devil who's got demonic forces that want to work against people to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus came to do the opposite. He came to give you life. But we've got to recognize there is the reality of an enemy. And unless you, call, you recognize you have an enemy, you won't battle the enemy. So that's kind of what we've come through in these last few weeks. Uh, but today I want to talk about the church in general. And a number of years ago, I was reading a really great book called Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness by a pastor named Jerry Cook. Um, it is a fantastic book. I highly recommend uh, that you read it. You'll be blessed by it. But in that book, Jerry uses this metaphor that I think is super helpful. And, and part of it is actually pretty Campbell River like relevant. Uh, I, I don't know about you. I love hosting people from out of town in Campbell River because unless you hadn't noticed, it's pretty good here. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Some of you came from other places and are just waiting for them to pull up the drawbridge. You like it that much, all right? But anyways, because uh, that's the island way. I'm here. Now I don't want anyone else to join the party because we just want to keep it this way. But anyways, we, we actually hosted some, uh, some of Deanna's family uh, on family day of all days. And it's fun to be able to tour people around and some of them especially that live in like places like Alberta and Saskatchewan, they're like, man, it's good here. Like there's mountains and trees and waterfalls and all these things. But we do have a, at least one pretty quirky Campbell River uh, hobby that I, I've never heard or seen people do it with such passion as we do here in Campbell River. It's posted in the newspaper. People follow on apps on their phones and then run out of their houses, what? To go see a cruise ship go by. Right? Some of you know that that's her thing. And it's like, you know, here comes this slow-moving, gigantic boat. And we're like, it's so pretty. And you can't help but stare at the thing because it's like taller than any building in Campbell River. And it's just beautiful, amazing. And I, I have been prone to go look at a, a cruise ship every now and then, too. They're beautiful. Right? Who wants, honest confession, who's a cruise ship watch, watcher here? Like, they're putting it in the newspaper for a reason. Someone's scheduling their life around that. But anyway... Although cruise ships are fun to watch, and maybe one day I'll get, on, get to ride on one, uh, I, I want to talk about the church today, and again, back to this metaphor that Jerry Cook used. And, and the first part of the metaphor is that the church is not a cruise ship. I know. It's, like, isn't, it's all about us, you know, because uh, on a cruise ship, what happens? Uh, I've, I've, you know, at least half, if not more than half of the people on the boat are there to do how much work? Zero. More than half the people on the boat are there to just be served. 
serve me, serve me, serve me, feed me whenever I want to eat. It sounds awesome, doesn't it? Uh, one day, one day. But anyways, it is not a good metaphor for the church. The church is not meant to be the cruise ship. It's meant to be a battleship. That's a very different world. A battleship, how many of the people there have a job to do? All of them. And it's a complex system of jobs for them all to do. Um, Deanna and I got to go to the, what's the name of the one there in San Diego, that beautiful aircraft carrier, I'm blanking on the name. Midway, there we go. This beautiful aircraft carrier you can go to in San Diego. And just follow along with me. It was so cool. Because you're going around there and realizing that in its heyday, four or 5,000 guys would be put onto this one boat and everyone had a job to do. And it's not just the top gun pilots that are required on that sort of a, uh, sort of a ship. Because not only do you need the pilot, you need the person to do the cool like take off thing and you need the mechanic to fix the airplane and then you need the chef to cook the food and somebody to serve the food and somebody to clean the dishes and peel the potatoes to feed all the people. You need the dentist on the boat so that if somebody's out in the middle of the ocean and they need that, you need that person too. You need administrators. You need secretary. You need all of these. You need somebody to make sure the paint is staying fresh. Everyone has a job to do. The church is meant to be a lot more like that aircraft carrier than the cruise ships that we like to watch going by. Because here now, here's a question. If an enemy was coming against you, would you rather be in the cruise ship or in the battleship? The battleship, right? Why? Because it's ready. They've been training in advance. They're ready to go. Everyone's been assigned. Everyone's following orders. They are fine. Ideally, they are fine-tuned. And the more successful they are is probably how much they've done all that hard work, a lot of it, well in advance. Where if an enemy comes against a cruise ship, it's like, what? I'm supposed to do something here? Where am I supposed to go? What is my job? How are we going to defend ourselves? It's a really helpful picture to contrast those two and our underlying, underlying assumptions about what the church is meant to be. The church of Jesus was never meant to just meet everybody's needs and a, few, a small crew takes care of all the stuff, but for everyone to man their station. And so today what I want to think about is this idea that not only does the devil come against us as individuals, and that is very true, there are also dynamics where the, the devil comes against churches and organizations in unique and different ways than he'll come against you as an individual. And so we need to be aware of the schemes of the enemy so that we can be ready for the battle when it comes. So I want to talk to you about the church this morning. And maybe you're here and this church thing is a bit new to you. I hope that in one sense that you're encouraged in the sense that when we're thinking about the church, we're not just thinking about how can we all sit around and love, you know, just get more and more from Jesus, but we want to be thinking about being a church that's making a difference, that's sharing something, that's changing the world, that's having an impact. And, and so I want to encourage you, maybe you're here today and, and uh, you're not even sure about the whole, this whole church thing, then I want you to just to hear our heart a little bit about what we think about ourselves, and I think you, you would be encouraged in that, that we're, we're very interested even in serving you and helping you find Jesus. We've got a mission to accomplish. And so if you've got your Bibles, let's quickly look to uh, Revelations chapter 2. And we're not going to read the entire chapter, entirety of chapter 2 and 3, but I just want to jump off of there today uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's a relatively well-known well chapters of the book of Revelation. And what's going on is that uh, Jesus is speaking to seven local churches back about 2,000 years ago. And these churches all are in different cities. These cities, you can, uh, some of the places, there are still cities there today. And some of the places, there's not even a city left. But back in the, back in the day, real churches, real people lived in these places. And here's the interesting thing. Jesus was aware and attentive to what was going on. Jesus was ministering in and around these churches. And I think it's also very true today that the presence of Jesus is very attentive to what's going on in the body, in the church. And the call to us is might we hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. 
But what I want to do is, in, in looking, there's, uh, in, in those two chapters, there are seven letters to seven churches, right? Pretty good math. But uh, there's something that I observed. Uh, we've taught out of these chapters before. But something I just want, I just observed again, putting on that lens of spiritual warfare, something that we see in four of the seven churches. And I believe it's present in the other three, but it's just not explicit in the, in the passages. But so let's look at the four that it's clear. I'm wanting to prove the case that the devil works against churches because I want us to broaden our understanding of the schemes that he'll use not only to kill, steal, and destroy from you as a person, but us as a whole. And so let's be aware. Uh, first, let's begin in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2 in verse 8. The first church, Ephesus, uh, they're, they're, they're encouraged in some ways. And uh, here in, in, in verse 8 of Revelation chapter 2, it says this. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Who is that? The first and the last who died and came to life. Who is it? Jesus. Good Sunday school answer. Well done. Jesus is speaking by the Spirit to these churches. And this is what he says. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Just this, I'm not going to preach out of that this morning. But there's this dynamic. In the natural, they were, it was tight. But in God's sight, they were rich beyond measure. But let's keep reading. They are facing tribulation and poverty and the slander of those who say that they were our Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So here already, they were being persecuted by seemingly Jewish people, but this is, Jesus is pretty clear. These are not followers of God. These are not the people of God. They're a synagogue of who? Of Satan. They were coming against this local church with tribulation, persecution, hard times. Verse 10, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for some day, for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Again, I just want to make the point here as we read that passage, is who is coming against the church? It's the devil. Now, the devil wants to throw some of them in prison. Does that mean a red horn pitchfork holding guy is going to jump out of the bushes and throw some of them into jail? No. The devil can use people. Through lie and deceit and influence, he can use them to come against even churches. This is a reality that we have to recognize. If I don't know there's a battle, I won't fight. But here, what do we see? A church... That is, they're being, they're being, they have tests and tribulations. This is what some of the ways that the devil will attack a local church. And church organizations more broadly, all these sorts of things. Tests and trials. And what, does that ha what happens in those moments? When we face tests and trials, we're tempted to give up. We're tempted to let in. But what, is, what does Jesus say to his church? Be faithful. Be faithful. Don't give up. How do we respond to that attack? We don't stand down. We stand strong in the Lord, Ephesians chapter 6. So there's one example going on to the next church, the church of Pergamum. And in that case, I won't read the whole thing, but they were suffering a different form of persecution, a different form of spiritual attack than the other church. That spiritual attack was false teaching. And this is actually one of the primary ways the devil will attack churches. False teaching. Uh, he says it a number of different ways that they, that, that um, uh, using again, well, I'll read some verses of uh, Revelation chapter 2, 14. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who uh, taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifices to idols, and practice sexual immorality. And going on and speaking about some other false teaching. Now, Balaam and Balak are Old Testament figures, but the spirit that was influencing them is still coming against churches today. False teaching that leads to some pretty funky behavior that doesn't honor the Lord. And so we need to be aware of the presence of false teaching. And I would say that that is, we're going to come back to this idea in a second, 
This is a huge thing for the church, even in our day today. The devil wants to come along and say, well, what about this idea? It sounds really nice and it feels really good. That must be from the Bible. God is love. He knows it. Go for it. The, the enemy is scheming. Why? He doesn't want to make your life better. He wants to kill and destroy. So again, highlighting one of the schemes is false teaching. This is the same problem in the next church in Thyatira. They also had false teaching that was leading them to, false, uh, to bad behavior. You know, again, using an Old Testament illustration, Jezebel, the same spirit that was working in Jezebel in the Old Testament, would come against the still churches even till today, causing us, seducing God's people to do things that they ought not to do. And what's the result? How do we respond? Well, actually, beyond that, too, listen to this. This is so interesting. In verse 24 of Revelation chapter 2, it says, But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold th this teaching, who have, learned, uh, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. Well, what kind of funky spiritual teaching was going on in that church? And I don't think that somebody got up in front of the church on a Sunday and was like, hey, everyone, I have a new teaching. It's called the deep things of Satan. Like, what would you all do if I got up and said that next Sunday? You would, like, book it for the door immediately. I don't think that, uh, but I think there are teachers coming along and saying, I've got some new revelation. I've got some more deeper, profound truth that if you just, if, if you just look at this the right way. And see, how, we're humans. We love new things. And we get drawn into seduction of, oh, that person has a, a fuller, deeper understanding than I do. I, I, I better go and see. We need to be careful, church. We need to be discerning. We're going to come back to that again in just a few minutes. But I think it's interesting. What is the call to that church if false teaching comes in? The response is repent, which means realize what you're believing is wrong and agree with God on what he says about the issue. Repent. Change your mind. Come back to the truth. And then just one other church for the sake of just illustrating once again, in Philadelphia, they have the same problem as the, the church in Smyrna, that there are Jews that are coming against him, that Jesus himself, but I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, uh, but lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet. Again, it's highlighting that this church was facing an adversary that was spiritually motivated. There are specific spiritual t attacks that come against churches. And so here, how are we going to respond to this today? I think our answer, we've already looked over the last few weeks. We respond in prayer. We respond in confidence. We know our enemy. He's defeated. We're with Jesus. Jesus wins. Thank you, Lord. Is anyone grateful? Amen? But I want to take this from a bit of a proactive stance. Just like we understand with our own natural bodies. It's interesting. Ken was meditating on this yesterday. That... One of the primary metaphors that God uses to help us understand what the church is supposed to be is the body. And I was just thinking about that. He's wanting us to understand who we are all together using an illustration that we're all very personally acquainted with. Right? Because even when I said earlier, the church is meant to be a battleship. For some of us, we're like, oh, I don't get the military thing. It doesn't, I'm not feeling that. I don't understand or, you know, the Bible can use other metaphors, too, of the church, and we might not be, the, might, the Bible uses the word family. The church is a family, and for some of us, we've got baggage with that word, and we're like, I'm not feeling that one either. <laughs> right? Can we be real? But the thing is, all of us have a body, and God wants to teach you about how we all work together by pointing you to, like, this thing right here. I think it's kind of neat. He wants you to understand how the body is meant to grow strong. And we get this in the natural. You know, if I don't want to get a flu or something like that, if I don't want to get a certain sickness, there's things I can do well in advance to fight off the enemy before the enemy comes along, right? I don't want to, like, unpack all the things, and I wonder if I might have offended a few people in first service, but that's okay. You know, <laughs> you could eat good food, because I, I, I threw in there. I couldn't help myself, and I just blurted it out. You could eat good food. You could exercise. You could get your flu shot, and then anyways, I realize that's a bit loaded. But anyways, <laughs> but what am I saying? In our natural bodies, we recognize there's things we can proactively do to be strong before the battle comes, right? Are you getting what I'm saying? Okay. It's the same thing in the spiritual body of the church. 
There are things we can proactively do before the attack so we're ready for the attack. And when it comes, we're strong. And we're like, we've got this thing. So what can we do? How can we all engage in this thing called the body of Christ and see the body become stronger than ever before? Here's another thing I want to highlight. Our primary passage for this sermon series has been Ephesians chapter 6. I won't read it all for us today. But Paul uses this metaphor that we're supposed to put on armor, the armor of God. A sword, a a breastplate, uh, shoes, a helmet, all these different pieces so that we can fight. Like that's why the Bible is using this metaphor. But there's something about all of those pieces of equipment. There is still one part of the human body that's not protected by all of those pieces of equipment. Do you know which one? The back. You've got a shield, you've got a sword, you've got a breastplate, you've got a helmet, you've got shoes, but there's nothing in there saying, oh, and cover your back. Why? Because you're not meant to fight alone. Who's supposed to cover your back? Somebody else in the body. And you're meant to cover theirs. So again, this takes it from a personal application to a corporate, a family, a church application. We all have something, that a part that we need to play. We are better together. We will fight battles against the devil better when we're standing side by side. We are stronger. And I think there's a supernatural dynamic to that. The Old Testament says, and speaking of over the nation of Israel, and I think we can apply it pretty fairly to us, that, you know, one of us, somebody help me out, one can put 50 or 10 to flight and two, 1,000 or something like that, that there is this compounding interest. And as we would battle together in strength, we're stronger than we are all on our own. So what can we do? And I want to take out of Romans chap- or sorry, Revelation chapter 2, uh, where the, the call to the church in Smyrna, in verse 10, in response to these trials, is to be faithful. How can we be faithful now? to be be ready for the battles that will come. I got four thoughts for us today. Again, there's probably more than four, but I think if we would not, if we would nail these four, we would be like, we would be jacked, spiritually speaking, as the body of Christ, ready to fight any sort of thing coming against us. Some of them are super easy, but it requires us to be intentionally engaged in these things. So number one, everyone say number one. one. Faithful to serve. Faithful to serve. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 11 says it like this. Ephesians 4 verse 11, again speaking directly about the body of Christ, it says this. And he, Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. God gave leaders, God gives leaders to churches so that everyone can do a job. Not just so the leaders can do the job and everyone sits on the cruise ship, right? That's back to that metaphor again. It's not so that some people get to lounge on the deck under the, because everyone else, a few are slaving away. No, no, no. All of us have our part to play. For the building up of the body of Christ. Building up that's speaking about strength, that's speaking about resilience, that's speaking about life. Until we all attain to the unity of faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We've got room to grow into something here, church. So that we may no longer, listen to this, be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Why do we all need to serve? Because there's spiritual warfare. Are are, are you not seeing there the parallel to Revelation? Human cunning, winds of doctrine, deceitful schemes. Who's coming against the church? The devil. With false teaching, interesting ideas to seduce and pull people away. And what's the antidote? Serve. Everybody serve. I I love the context. Like All these things start to sew together. Like, uh, that would be good if I just read the part about all doing, the, the, all doing our part. But it's in the context of spiritual attack that we're meant to do our part. Let's go on and read verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped. 
when each part, everyone say each part. Thanks for helping me preach this morning. <laughs> is working properly. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. How does the church get strong? We all play our part. So let's be real practical here. The call is that everyone would serve somewhere. And God actually, we don't have time to unpack it all today. God has given you unique talents, abilities, skills, and gifts to use not only in your everyday life, but to use in your relationship with other believers. Gifts like service, gifts like teaching, gifts like administration, gifts like leadership, and then also some things that you just got to get done. You know, it's just like at your house. There are some jobs that no one is particularly gifted for, but the job's got to get done. And all the mothers said, amen. No. <laughs> is it, I don't know if anyone has the spiritual gift of sweeping, <laughs> but somebody's got to sweep the floor, right? Now, there are spiritual gifts like, you know, somebody, I'm trying to think of a good example of uh, just not think of my own spiritual gifts or something like that. But there are, all, there are all manner of spiritual gifts that people operate in. And it's fun to watch people thrive in their gifting. There's gifts, but then there's just service that has to get done. And we all have a part to play. All right, you catching me? And so here's the thing I want to encourage us. If you're a believer, where are you serving? And now, some of you are already serving, and you're like keener servers, and you're like, oh, no, Pastor Matt wants me to do more. No, I don't. The church isn't stronger when a few people do even more. The church is stronger when everyone does their part. Somebody came up, Val McDonald came up to me, after, and she's a trooper. She's awesome. She loves to serve the Lord. And she's been serving the Lord in this past season by watching the kids at women's Bible study. Now, does she have a particularly get? Well, she's really fun and bubbly. She's not, like, that's not her primary passion in life. But if she serves the kids, then the moms get to receive from the Lord. I love it. Everyone playing their part. She came up to me and she's like, my mother told me. Many hands make light work. In the church, many hands make a strong body. Where can we serve? And so also, so some of you, I'm not, I'm, if you're already serving, keep on in your service. Some of you are not serving because you've been hurt by the church and you're afraid to try again. I want to encourage you, receive healing in the Lord and begin to serve again. And then there's others that are like, I want to serve. I just literally have no idea. That's totally fair. And my encouragement to you is just start something. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was growing up in the church, I remember one of the first places that I served in ministry was a kid's choir. I was like 16 or 17. My brother and I are like, that person used to do kid's choir. They're not doing it anymore. We kind of looked at each other. and We're like, we could probably do that. And so we're like, let a kid's choir. Was that my gifting in life to be the director of kids' choirs forever? No. But it was something that needed to be done. And my, I have a twin brother, too, and he's a pastor. Actually, at the home church, we used to teach the kids' choir. But we started somewhere. And, and then that led to something else. You know, I didn't just get to, it wasn't just randomly somebody was like, hey, do you want to preach like 45 weeks out of the year at this pulpit? Maybe you should give that a try. Like, that's not the way it worked. We, I started somewhere. And then you start honing a gift and realizing, well, that's not music. I like it, but it's not my thing. But I really love it when I can teach. And I should go be equipped to do that so I could serve better. And then the Lord, uh, I think the, our gifts make room for themselves. But start somewhere. Maybe you start somewhere and you're like, man, I don't like this at all. Well, great. Now you got one thing to check off the list of my gift's probably not that. Then you go find out something else. But think again, when everyone does their part, the body grows. That's number one, is we're faithful to serve. Your service, even though it might look little, is not insignificant. Can I, I, Larry's not even here, but I'll boast on Larry. Larry so faithfully serves our church body by like mowing the lawn. And he was around here this week. He's like, how, I was just, he wanted to see how everything had done through the winter and the pruning and all these sorts of things. You know, if no one did that, he would show up and it'd be like, you know, ooh, I don't know if I want to go in there. You know, everyone has a part to play. Find your part. Okay, number two, faithful to pray. Again, sometimes in the natural, seemingly, is it prayer? What is it? No, prayer is a powerful weapon. 
In Ephesians chapter 6, in talking about the gifts of the Spirit, no, sorry, not the gifts of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, talking about the armor of God, the application is prayer. That's why after the armor of God, it says in Ephesians 6, verse uh, 18, praying in, at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. How do I put the armor of God? It enables me to pray powerfully. And prayer is one of the primary tools we have to fight, to fight spiritual battles. And we can all kinds of prayers. I pray in the Spirit. I think that means I'm led by the Spirit in how I pray. I also think that means I pray in my spiritual prayer language, speaking in tongues. It's a wonderful tool. When I don't know how to pray in English, I can pray in a, a spirit language God gave me. And some of you are like, ooh, what is he talking about? We'll explain it another day. Uh, or we'll talk to you about it afterwards. But there's these, God wants to equip us to pray. Prayer changes things. And so one, one, what I'm wanting to do is I'm shamelessly using this as a plug for our March prayer challenge. In March, starting next Sunday, we are going to pray. We're calling for 96 people to pray 15 minutes a day for the month of March. Why 96 for 15? Because that's 24 hours a day to pray. And we're not going to worry about scheduling everybody so, like, you start at, like, 1.30 a.m. in the morning and then your turn is one. Because that's, God is beyond, outside of time. He's bigger than that anyways. It's not a bad idea, but that's just not what we're doing. We're saying commit to pray for 15 minutes at any point in the day, and that equals 24 hours. How cool. Not as a thing of, like, that's going to show us how spiritual we are. No, we just want to seek the Lord in prayer because he's invited us into it. So it kind of just gives us something to get our heads around. And 15 minutes is a stretch for many, but it's not impossible. You know, that's just 15 less minutes scrolling on Facebook. That's like a quarter of a news broadcast. I don't know whatever your thing is. Like, we're not, it's, it's not, we're going to pray for six hours a day for the month of March. No, 15 minutes. Because we're all going to do our part. I want to encourage you, would you join us in that prayer challenge? And so this is what I want us to do right now. Would you reach in the seat pocket? Did you like Gian's thing today? In the seat pocket in front of you or right to the side. Would you pull a blue card out right now and wave it in the air? I want to see it. I'm going to wait. Blue card, wave it. If you want this to be over, then wave the card faster. All right? <laughs> we can get the air moving a little bit also in here. That's totally good. If there's not one in front of you, there's one behind you. Okay. Right now, if you want to join us in that 15-minute-a-day prayer challenge, write your name and email address on that card, and on your way out, I will remind you, hand it in to a host on the way out. Why do it now? Because some of us are like, oh, I'm totally going to do it, and then we put that in our imagination, never tell anyone, and it doesn't help, okay? <laughs> write down your name and email. We're going to add you to an email list, just so you know. I will not bog down your email, but you will receive periodic emails to encourage you. How can you pray for our church family through that month of March? I just wonder, and I'm excited about the possibility. What if 96 of us, what if we covered 24 hours a day of prayer in concerted, focused prayer, not in a new work, but just trusting the Lord in faith? What might we, what might we see the Lord as we agree together for our church family. I'm excited about it, and I want to encourage you to join us. Name, email, hand it in on the way out so you don't need to go to the website and sign up later. You can do it right now, and myself or Kelly will put your name in on the list, okay? I want to make your life, be well, we want to serve you, but this is not a cruise ship, amen? All right, so we're going to do that. We're going to pray together for the strengthening of our body, and I'm excited about it. God has... There's a whole city here in Campbell River of 30-some-odd thousand people that need the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen? And what if we would say, Lord, give us this city? The good question is, well, how are we going to do that? Well, let's pray and hear from the Lord. And he'll direct us to where we, what our call is. Let's open our ears to hear. My people would humble themselves and pray. It's going to be exciting. Okay, number three. Out of our four, be faithful to gather. You're here at 11, and so you're here. You're working in that, but I want to encourage you. Hebrews chapter 11, 25 says this, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. That day drawing near is the return of Jesus. And believer, we are called to be together. We are stronger when we hang out. 
How can we be strong and contend and cover each other's backs if we're like, oh, I'll see you in six weeks or something like that? No, no, no. We're called to gather, and that's just not Sunday morning. That's, and it's not just programs. It's not just join a life group, although that's a great thing. It's not just take OSL, and we've got a group of six graduating uh, this afternoon. Praise the Lord. It's not just uh, a class like Bible interpretation, which is going to be awesome. We've got eight people coming down from Gold River to take that course, so let's join in on that too. I'll teach. It's going to be awesome. Um, but it also looks like, hey, let's get together for coffee. Hey, I was thinking about you, and I want to f- call you on the phone. That's building up the body. Some of those little things as we would be faithful to gather together. And even that challenge to not neglect to meeting together, the context of that is also persecution for the church. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30, just a few verses down, it says, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. What is this saying? Just after he says, don't give up meeting together, he's like, remember that time in your faith where the enemy wanted to sidetrack you and came against you and you had hard times? He's saying, let's be strong together so that we can stand in those moments. Actually, I want to encourage you. Hebrews 10 there is talking about people that had just been enlightened. What does that mean? People that were new Christians. It is not unusual. If you're a newer Christian, the devil is not happy with you. Because he wants to tear you back down. He wants to drag you back into the pit. But when you grab onto some other Christians and say, and and other Christians grab onto you, we can stand those tests that the enemy wants to throw at you. Again, if you're a new Christian, don't be surprised if things didn't go flawlessly for you because you have an enemy that's already at work. And he's like, if I can get you quick, this will be easier. Stand strong. Gather, be faithful to gather. Number four, we are going to be faithful to the word. This is one of the primary ways that the devil wants to tear the church down is by causing us to abandon the word of God. And I'm going to tell you as your pastor, we will never abandon the word of God. What do I mean by that? This book, the Bible, is God's word for us. And we believe that God, by his spirit, inspired it to be written, made sure that we have what we need in it so that we can have all the instruction we need for life and for godliness. This is God's word. It's an inerrant. It's inspired. It is the word of God. And we will not back down from that conviction. It doesn't matter how much the devil tries to cause us to doubt it. Can I get an amen? This is one of the key battlegrounds that's come against the church. It's happened already in our country, and the devil's not done yet. There are church movements in Canada that the more and more that they've abandoned confidence in God's word, the more and more that they've become effective, lifeless, and are dying. How can you stand strong if you're not being fed the word of God? Like those guys on the midway, the big gigantic battleship, why did they have to have all these people making all this food? Ideally, it was tasty. Because how is the pilot going to fly if he's tired and thinking about where his next meal is coming from? Church, the word of God is nourishment to us. We will never be ready to fight a battle if we will not commit ourselves to feeding from the word of God. And particularly, that means we need to avoid False teaching that would love to creep into the church. Acts chapter 20 is an example of this. Acts chapter 20 verse 29 says this. Paul speaking to the church, the Ephesians actually. He says, after, uh, I know ap- that after my depart- departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Remembering that for, the th- that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. A couple really key points out of that passage. One is even the early church knew false teaching would creep up in the church. These people lived within decades of the ministry of Jesus, and they were at risk. How do you think a church that's now 2,000 years ago uh, away from the ministry and life of Jesus is uh, 
is possibly prone to giving in to false teaching. We need to be alert. How do we discern what's true and what's bad? By knowing God's word, by allowing the spirit to give us discernment, by committing ourselves to say the standard by which we will judge any teaching is by does it line up with this thing? Because the devil isn't an idiot. Like he's an idiot in that sense, like he's the devil and he's defeated and he's going to be thrown in the lake of fire he's already done with. Praise the Lord. But he's not an idiot in the sense that he's not smart in his strategies against God's people. And there's all these different ways he does it. It's often not, I'm going to teach you some deep truth from Satan this morning. Like that, no pastor is saying that. But still, churches are tempted to teach things contrary to God's word that look really good and feel really good. God, God is loving, and that means that there's, there's nothing he would tell you not to do because God is love. A misapplication of God's word causing us to go on all crazy sorts of things. It's been the thing he's done since the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. He said to them, did God really say? And what are the things coming against the church these days? Did God really say that back then? Because they lived in a different culture. And clearly that God wasn't thinking about things that are happening in our day and age. If he'd have known that, he wouldn't have said those sorts of things. There's the schemes of the enemy coming against the church. The Bible was written in, in a very like uh, hierarchical society. And, and we just know better these days. And so clearly we can't apply those things. The enemy wants to come and cast doubt into your heart. Six days for creation? Ah. And the enemy wants to cast doubt into your heart? So what do we do? We fight by committing ourselves to God's word. And not just kind of blindly saying, I like God's word. No, let's get into God's word. Let's know God's word. Let's study God's word. If, I, if you get a question in your heart that comes up, like, how does that work? Find an answer. Because if not, the devil's going to be like, Ding, 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 ding. Let's sow some doubt into there. I've seen so many people do that thing. They leave one area of doubt, and then that snowballs. And they're like, do I even have a faith at all anymore? The devil is, he's dumb in the one sense that he keeps doing the same thing over and over again, but people keep falling for it. Be alert. Let's commit ourselves to God's word. And again, I wanted to say that from the pulpit. Why are we saying this? Because there are winds of teaching and doctrine that are still coming against the church. And don't be surprised for new teachings that will come along to try to convince us to be shipwrecked and go off to some crazy side or tangent. As a people of God at Gateway Foursquare Church, are we perfect? No. But we're going to do our best to humbly come before God's word. I'm not talking about some fundamentalist sort of thing where we blindly, without thinking, kind of like spout stuff off that we don't even understand. No, no, no. We are humbly coming to the word and saying, Lord, teach us by your spirit. And we need to even from time to time recognize, man, I was wrong on that idea. And I love that attitude better than I'm always right and I'm not changing from my position. That's not what we're talking about. But a commitment that this will be and still will remain. That's how we will grow in strength and stay strong as a church, ready to fight any battle the devil's got coming. He's defeated. Eh? Amen? Yeah. Amen. So, church, we are called to be faithful, to be strong, be battle ready, not just as individuals, but as the body. Faithful in prayer, faithful to gather, faithful in the word, and ready to serve. Can we stand together this morning? Ed, if you could come, that'd be awesome. Thanks for sticking around. I want to pray. And again, the Lord put this on word on my heart earlier in the week to just touch on this topic. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Lord is prepping us for something that will happen in the next little season, just to be ready. God is faithful that way. He, he, he puts things on our radar in advance so that we can be prepared. God wants us. Praise the Lord. God wants us to win. Amen. And he's going to set us up to do it. And we're going to do it best when we do it together. We are better together at Gateway Foursquare Church. And if you're visiting us today, we're so glad that you're here. We're so glad. And my prayer is that either if you don't have a home church, we'd love for you to make this your home church. If you already have a home church, well, plug in strong there. Find a body to belong to. 
You're not meant to do this Christian thing on your own. We're battle ready when we stand side. Well, if, if I got your back and you've got mine. It's so exciting. And we've got a lot of room for more people to come into that and also be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Can we just pray as we conclude? God, we thank you so much for your word. And I thank you for the way that you want to make it clear for us. Lord, you don't want us to be surprised when the enemy comes to attack. Lord, you don't want us to be surprised when, when things get hard at churches. You don't want us to be surprised when, when uh, people go a bit sideways or haywire. Lord, it's no surprise because you've warned us in advance that those things would happen. And so, God, I pray that you would find each of us here faithful to be doing our part. In the midst of persecution, in the midst of trials, and amidst the schemes of the devil, that we would be faithful. We would endure. We would not give up or grow faint. And so, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, I pray for Gateway, Lord, that you would continue to strengthen us, build us up as a body so that we can fight every scheme of the devil. Thank you, Lord. And with our heads closed and our eyes bowed, I'm not going to make a salvation call, though that's not inappropriate. That's the way to get into this family, is by putting your own faith in Jesus. But today I want to encourage you, each of us right now, in this moment, before the Lord, and say, Lord, what am I supposed to do this week? How do I help build my church this week? Let's ask the Lord for one, maybe two things that you could practically do. Prayer, finding a place to serve, committing yourself afresh to the word, committing to maybe signing up for a life group or joining us at Bible Interpretation, joining us for the next OSO. There's a thing God would have you do. Could you ask him right now in your own words, in your own heart, Lord, what, what can I do to respond to this word today? I want to be a part of a battleship, not a cruise ship. Lord, what's my part? Lord, I pray that you would speak to each of us. I thank you, Lord, as each part does its part, the whole thing grows. And Lord, we want to have a healthy body that's fit, battle ready. Thank you that it takes each of us Thank you for the value in each part. Thank you, Lord, for the destinies, the callings you've put before us that we'll only be able to fully express together. How awesome. I thank you, Lord, that you see every little piece. You see every part. And you value it. You honor it. You've empowered it. And it, it's people. So I thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord that you're building our church. Can we do one more thing this morning? Can we respond by prayer? I want us to take 40 seconds, a minute, and can we pray for Gateway as we conclude our service this morning? And what do I mean by that? Not just listen to me pray for Gateway. Let us all pray for our church family. I've got a microphone close to my mouth. You'll probably hear my voice. But I want to encourage all of us to pray. If you're a believer here today, let's pray out loud and in faith for our church family. 45 seconds a minute. Can we do that? Okay, let's all say amen. Now your voice is warmed up a little bit. And it's not the louder you pray, God hearing you more, but there's something about us when we pray that we would say. That's how Jesus taught his disciples, that we pray out loud. Can we do that? Let's begin. Let's pray now. A house of prayer. Lord, we lift up Gateway Foursquare Church to you this morning. And God, we speak blessing in the name of Jesus over this family of faith. God, we thank you that we once again can submit to your lordship as a people. And God, we do that today. Lord, I pray that in a fresh way that you would bring our hearts in humility before you. That we would surrender and submit ourselves. God, I pray that where it's required, would you give us hearts of repentance. Lord, to come before you where we need to come in alignment with your truth in our lives and in our church. Lord, we resist the work of the devil together in the name of Jesus. We resist his schemes. We say, no, you have no place here in Jesus' name. God, we ask that you would cause us to be more fruitful, that we would multiply. God, we pray for the life of Jesus to be made manifest. God, I ask for more salvations in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask for more miracles in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask for people to come to Christian maturity in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that every lie and scheme of the devil would be broken off, and I pray that your life, Lord, would, we, would, we would 
experience it, that this place truly would be an open door to life in Jesus. Lord, we bless our church today. We bless your, the work of your hand in this place, and we thank you that you will have started a good work. You will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. Lord, we thank you for every good promise, and we speak your blessing on this church. In your name we pray, and God's people said, amen. There's something about God's people praying together in unity and faith. And so, as we wrap up this morning, I want to encourage you, if you filled out that card, if you're in on that March prayer challenge, next Sunday is March 1st, so it's a great day to start the month together. You won't have to remember. Just sign up today, and I'll remind you next Sunday that we're starting to pray. But would you pass in? Hey, Bridget, are you there at the door? I'm thankful for Bridget. She's like the, the most smiley and the best greeter. Uh, we got a lot of great greeters, but I'm really thankful for Bridget. You could pass in that card to her on your way out the door today so that we'll enter you into that email prayer list. If you would like prayer, we'd love to pray with you at the end of the service over here on the far side. We love you. Bless you. Have an incredible week in the name of Jesus. And we'll see you soon. Amen. Praise the Lord.